Hello, welcome to RC Video Reviews. In today's video, we're gonna talk about the newly released Edge TX 2.7. I'm gonna show you all the highlights and what's changed, and then I'm gonna show you how to install it on your radio. Edge 2.7 is referred to as Black Pearl. Today we're gonna to cover the highlights of the changes. Mostly what I'll focus on are the things that are directly user impacting, which means something you can see and touch on the radio. But I don't wanna diminish the work that the developers are doing under the covers because there's a great deal of work they're doing on the hardware and the firmware itself that you don't necessarily see or feel, but are nevertheless very important to the development of Edge. So what I'll do is put a link in the description showing you a list of highlights that they've changed for 2.7 that I'm going to focus on today. And then there'll be another link in the description to cover every single change they've made since 2.6. The other thing I want to touch on is that we no longer have to worry about the YAML upgrade because there were no fundamental changes to the file structure from 2.6 to 2.7. So this part is very important if you're still on 2.5. The 2.5 to 2.7 conversion can be done, but you really want to watch the, the video that I posted on converting from 2.5 to 2.6 because it covers some very important concepts relating to the file storage called YAML. In 2.7, there were no changes to that file system, so you don't really have to worry about it. And going forward, this should be a lot easier now. I'm not aware of too many more issues where we're going to have to have a fundamental file system change that the user is going to have to be concerned with. The first thing we'll touch on are model templates for color radios. I did a full video on this and I'll put a link for that video in the description so you can watch the entire process, but I'll give you a quick preview on what it looks like today. If you go on the model selector and press the jog dial, you'll see an option for create model. And when you hit create model, there's a new screen that pops up asking you to select a template folder. I've created a couple of model templates in my personal folder. I made a couple of airplanes, so I've got a Katana and a Warbird. So just for example, I'll choose the Katana. And when I press that, you can see it creates a model based on my model template for the Katana that I built. So I've got the timer and the widget, no image on this one, but you get the idea. It creates the model based on that template. So that's the first change. The next big change was the per model ADC filter. And that one's real simple. If you're not sure what to do about this, there's a real simple rule I'll teach you. If you're flying a craft that's got a flight computer like Betaflight or an INAV, you wanna set the ADC filter to be off. If you're flying a craft that uses PWM servos connected to your receiver, you want your ADC filter to be on. The ADC filter is simply an analog to digital converter filter, and what it does is it kind of smooths out the variations in the filter mathematics so that you don't see peaks and spikes in the conversion from analog to digital. And the reason you turn it off when you have Betaflight or INAV is because Betaflight and INAV know how to deal with that, and they smooth it out for you. So turn it off if you have a Betaflight or INAV model and turn it on if you have PWM. Now there are a couple of different strategies you can deploy. There's a global filter and the per model setup lets you decide how you wanna react. You can either follow the global option, in this case it says global, or you can turn it off or you can turn it on. So my suggestion for implementing this in your own model setups is to decide what you primarily fly. So if you primarily fly craft that have a beta flight computer, you probably want to go in and set your ADC filter globally to off. That's right here on the system page under hardware. So set that to off. And then if you decide you want to add an airplane with a PWM servo in your per model screen, you would set that ADC filter to be on. And that way your airplane will use the ADC filter. If you predominantly fly PWM craft, you want to set your global filter to be on. And then if you add a beta flight or INAV craft, you can tell it in the per model setting to turn the ADC filter off. The next big update is the Immersion Ghost 12-bit mode. So if you're flying around with Immersion Ghost, you now have 12-bit over-the-air support for the protocol, which is awesome because that gives you a lot more resolution. It basically doubles it. When you add a bit of resolution, you effectively double the precision. So you go from 2048 to 4096 in terms of precision, which is a nice upgrade. I don't have a Ghost module, so I can't show you what that looks like, but the 12-bit support is there in Ghost now. They also added support for the Lemon RX DSMP transmitter module. So if you use the Lemon transmitter module, you now have support in Edge TX natively for that. Next up is a serial driver rewrite that allows for customizations regarding GPS and say Bluetooth items you might use on the bottom ports on the aux ports down here. So you've got the aux one and aux two ports on the bottom. So on the hardware page, you have the option of changing what those ports do. So notice here on the bottom, we've got aux one and aux two. You have a drop down list that now specifies what those devices are. So you can select GPS 
or Lua or Telemetry In. So you have some options there on what those devices do. And then secondly, they added this third line called the Virtual Com Port. And this is a USB Virtual Com Port driver that allows you to connect the radio to your, your computer via USB and utilize a Virtual Com Port. So you get a couple of different options there, including command line interface, Lua, and a telemetry mirror if that's what you'd like to do. I have it on good authority that the label on the serial port VCP will be updated to kind of re more accurately reflect what it's doing. So in case you're not sure, the label will give you a little bit more of a description. Next up was an option for a custom throttle positioning. And this is probably mostly for people who fly quads that have the ability to reverse their throttle. I think that's what this is really aimed at. But I'll show it to you anyway, just in case you're interested in what it does. So you have an option in Edge TX to confirm or check the throttle state when you select a model. So I'm going to turn that on in the first place. The next thing I'll do is select the custom position option by putting a check there. And then the position percentage is a range from negative 100 to 100. Remember, zero is the middle. So if I set my stick at zero and I tell the radio to give me a warning if the stick is not at zero, then what will happen when I select this model is the stick will have to be centered in order to not see the throttle warning. And I'm just gonna verify my stick position by opening the channel monitor. We'll talk about that in just a second. So I'll set it at zero, right, whoop, right there is zero. And then we'll, what we'll do is reload the model. So I'll back out, I'll press the jog dial, we'll go to reset telemetry and reset flight and notice I have no warnings, right? No warnings because I have the throttle at zero. Now if I bring the throttle off of zero and then do the same thing, I'll just reset the flight so go to reset telemetry, reset flight. Notice how I have a throttle warning and the throttle message says throttle not idle. It needs to be at 0%. So it's telling me you need to be at 0%. So if I move my stick to zero, that's where the throttle warning goes away. And you can set that to any value between negative 100 and positive 100. So if you set it, say, to negative 100, that means the stick has to be all the way down. And if you set it to positive 100, the stick has to be all the way up. So I'll just show you that real quick. We'll leave the throttle off the top position. I'll do a quick reset flight. And there's the warning. If I push my stick all the way up to 100, you see that warning goes away. So now you can set your throttle position to be wherever you want it to be. Nice little update. The next new feature is on the output screen where they show a channel change in direction on the output screen and in the edit screen. And I think what they mean by that is when you move the stick, you can see the output color changing. So it's showing you when I move to the left, this is the value that's impacted by the move to the left. Whereas I move to the right, this is the value. So the invert option has always been on the output screen, but now you have these colors changing to show you which value is impacted by which stick direction, which is kind of cool. And then if you go in the edit screen, you also see the same thing up here. You'll see the min and max values getting highlighted as you move the stick. Also take note, they put a monitor function up top, so you can see that on the bar right here, where you, as you move the stick, you can see the difference between the mix line and the actual output line, and then also pay attention to the little icon they have there. That icon indicates a reverse servo as well. So if you take that inverted option off, that icon goes away, and then the mix line and the output line follow each other as normal. So those are nice little updates to the output screen to kind of give you an idea as you're doing your configuration what's actually happening on the radio. The next update is the showing of mixer bars on the edit screen for mixes and outputs. And of course, I just covered that for the output screen, but I'll show you that on the mix screen as well. So if we go to the mixer and open up an item, you can see we've got a mix line right here. Again, very handy. If you're making changes, you decide, well, I'm going to change my weight to 89. You want to verify that you're seeing 89 on your mixer. Also very handy if you're actually creating a mix. Say you want to mix your aileron and rudder together. And while you're, while you're doing the mix work, you want to test the outcome. You can see what's happening when you move your aileron to the rudder right there on the, on the outputs line on the monitor. They added support for opening log files in the text viewer on color screen radios. I don't have any log files on this one, so I can't show you what that looks like. But if you do use log files, evidently there's an option now to look at those log files in the text viewer on the radio. And you would simply go to your SD card, navigate to logs, and then if you have logs in here, you'd be able to click on one and take a look at what that log is showing you. Another feature is for sticky logical switches. They set it up so that they will remain off specifically until you set them. So if you're using the sticky function in a logical switch, that will now be off until it is set. That's kind of important for logic flow purposes, especially on the reload of a radio. 
for radios that have one of these rotary wheels, there's a new option under the system setup or radio setup where you can go down to the bottom and invert the rotary. So notice in this case, when I push my wheel to the left, the scroll or cursor goes up. And when I push the wheel to the right, the cursor goes down. There's an option now if you hit invert rotary that reverses that process. So now if I go to the left, the cursor goes down. And if I go to the right, the cursor goes up. If you want to change the direction of your rotary encoder, you now have the ability to do that. Now back to the model setup page, they added this open channel monitor right here on the top. So anywhere along the model setup page, there's a little item right here that's a touchscreen option to open the channel monitor anytime you want. And they brought back one of my all-time favorites from OpenTX is that anywhere in the model setup, you can also press the model button and that brings up the channel monitor as well. If you have a radio with a multi-protocol module or a crossfire module, there's now the ability to retrieve module software information from those devices by clicking on system and going to the information screen and clicking on modules RX version. So you can see the internal module. I've got the version number of 1.3.3.7 in AETR mode. And then my external module says crossfire, but for the express LRS unit I'm using, it's showing me it's Hertz rate and error mode. So I don't think that's quite right. I know the developers will watch this. They'll advise on what to do there, but keep in mind, that's not a crossfire module. That's actually an express LRS transmitter on the back there, 2.4 gigahertz. So I know the developers will watch this. They'll advise on what to do there. And maybe it's just not supported for express LRS yet. Inactivity the final option I'll cover is the addition of the ability to touch the screen to dismiss inactivity the inactivity alarm. So if we just touch the screen, that should dismiss the inactivity alarm. And it does. Okay, keep in mind, I did not cover every single thing they changed in 2.6 to 2.7. I really focused on the user usability features. I'll put a link in the description for what I did cover, and I'll put a link in the description for the entire change log. So if you wanna see every single thing they did, feel free to click on the link and go take a look. What I try to focus on are things that will be directly user impacting regarding your operation of the radio. So that's the focus point for today's video. All right, the next thing we'll do is upgrade the radio. I have my Esheen TX16S. This is responsible for flying my helicopters, and I'll quickly show you the version I've got by pressing System and then Page Left, and on the info screen, you can see I've got 2.6. The next thing I'll do is turn off the radio and plug in my computer via the supplied USB-C cable to the top port, USB-C, and you'll notice we get some Knight Rider lights, but the radio remains powered off. That's important, it's off, right? We're just in what's called DFU mode on the radio. The next thing we'll do is go to buddy.edgetx.org in your browser. I'll put a link for that in the description as well. And for firmware version, you wanna select 2.7, which is the Black Pearl release. And then for the radio model, in my case, it's TX16S. Choose the radio that's appropriate for you. On my case, TX16S. And then I'll click flash via USB. Now, when I do that, because I haven't added this radio to Buddy yet, I'll click add new device and you'll see I get a pop-up. I'm looking for STM bootloader. That's the one I want, STM bootloader. I'll hit connect. And then once I've done that, Buddy offers me the option to click next again and we'll start flashing. So once we've done that, the firmware is downloaded and you can see Buddy going to work, taking the old firmware off the radio and it will begin the process momentarily of flashing the new one. So we'll just let this play out. I'll go ahead and speed the video up so you don't have to wait for the entire flash process, but it does take a little bit of time. With the flashing process complete, Buddy gives us a message saying flashing is done. You click on the done button and there you go, you're upgraded. So I'll disconnect the USB connector on the computer, we'll power the radio on, and then we'll immediately go over to the system page and take a look and see what the system page shows us regarding the version number. So there it is, version 2.7.0. Now I'm gonna show you the way I like to upgrade my radio because it's a lot faster. So I'll turn the radio on its top, connect the USB-C cable again, and I will click on USB storage. And then once I've done that, back on Buddy, still stick with Black Pearl 2.7. I'll select my radio model being the TX16S, and then I'm gonna download the binary file instead. So I'm gonna click download, and when I do that, I'll have the option for selecting my radio, and I'm gonna put it in the firmware folder right here. And I'm gonna look for a name that's recognizable to me. In this case, they already have it set at TX16S version 2.7.0 bin, so I'm good with that. I'll click save, and that's it. 
So now we'll disconnect the radio from the computer. We'll turn the radio off and then we'll press the T4 and T1 buttons inboard and press the power button until it goes into bootloader mode. And then while it's in bootloader mode, we'll select write firmware and I'm going to select TX16S version 2.7.0.bin and I'll press the jog dial one time short and then one time long and that writes the firmware and you can see how much faster that write process is and that's why I prefer this method over Buddy. Buddy works but it uses a mode called DFU and it's got to validate each block to make sure you get a complete firmware write and in the radio when you're writing directly from the radio to the memory space that holds the firmware it doesn't have to perform those same sets of checks. So it's just a lot faster on the radio. Now we're done, I can hit return and exit, and we'll go back into the radio and verify we're on 2.7. System button, page left, and there we go, version is 2.7.0. In this video, we covered all the major user impacting changes between EdgeTX 2.6 and 2.7. Remember, I'll have a link in the description if you want to review every single change. I'll give you that link so you can go look for yourself. We also showed how to upgrade the radio via buddy.edgetx.org and how to copy the firmware directly to your SD card firmware folder and write the firmware from the bootloader itself. I hope you found the information useful and if you like this kind of content, make sure you hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you know when new videos hit the channel. That's all I've got for today. Take it easy. Hey, if you like the work I do here on RC Video Reviews, please consider joining me on Patreon. For about the price of a cup of coffee, you can help me keep making videos just like this one. If you'd like to help out, there's a link in the description and on your screen.